So, Dr. Kaiser, you are an uh, Old Testament scholar. Um, one hot topic uh, in today's culture is the applicability of the Old Testament to our culture. And specifically as it relates to sexual ethics, people will say, well, those sexual ethics don't apply today because I don't apply the shellfish laws of Mosaic law to, to, to us today. So should the Old Testament law be applicable to New Testament believers? How do you approach that topic? Gently, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the biblical text is very clear that God who made men and women has the priority and the authority to say uh, what those men and women should or should not do. And therefore, in their human sexuality, this too is taught by God. I think we'd have to go to Proverbs uh, 5, verse 15 through 23. There is a uh, very nice uh, setting where he says, uh, using parabolic uh, language, figurative language, drink water out of your own well. And when you first read that, you say, well, I guess so, if you're not hooked up to city water. Uh, you would drink water out of your own well. But as it goes on, it is quite clear he's talking about the marital act of having relations one with another, but it should be exclusively with your uh, spouse and not with someone else. And it goes on to make this clear as you go down through this little allegory. There you do have a deliberate allegory. And the same thing too, uh, when you come to the New Testament, Romans 1 is saying the same thing. And uh, some have left their natural affections for uh, uh, someone of the opposite sex and therefore have gone with someone of the same sex. And Paul says this is an abomination. This is not what God has made. So scripture is very, very clear on an awful lot of the aspects of uh, uh, marriage. And I'll tell you how important it was with our Lord having only three years to get everything across he's going to get to his 12 men who are his uh, uh, men that he is mentoring uh, he takes one whole day in Cana to go to a wedding feast. And what the living word did by attending a marriage feast, the written word did by putting a whole book in the Bible on marriage, which is Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. Uh, this is why you say a superlative in the Hebrew. So it's just this, this song is just out of this world. The biblical text on uh, the wholesomeness of the uh, sexes and the marriage and the relationship, uh, God spent a lot of time first making male and female, and he brought them together and uh, pronounced the good. Uh, so I think there is good teaching on that, and I wish we had more courage to teach it uh, wholeheartedly. So, so I give the instance of sexual ethics as, a, as an example, um, and you're saying that in regards to sexual ethics, that's reaffirmed throughout the Bible. But, but in regards to just the Mosaic legislation as a whole, you know, lots of different people have approached it in different ways. The, the Westminster Confession says we should divide the Mosaic legislation into, mo into moral, civil, and ceremonial, and the civil and ceremonial no longer apply, but the moral does. How, how, how do you approach that? Well, I think there is an element of truth there, and I'll tell you where I get it. Matthew 23, 23, where uh, they came to Jesus and asked about tithing mint and bruise and anise. And 
Jesus said, yes, these ought you to have done, it still was Old Testament times, and not to have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Our Lord thought some laws were heavier than others. So therefore, I may not like, actually I do like, but as a person, I may not like uh, moral, ceremonial, and civil divisions, but that's not a bad way of uh, understanding the ceremonial law. The whole book of Hebrews was written to tell us that the Savior had fulfilled that. So I'm not planning on taking sheep and goats to church this week. Uh, now, there may be some that want to do that, but uh, uh, I would urge and be rather sheepish about that. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to get your goat. I'm just <laughs> trying to help you to understand that. But uh, I think there are still other things where in the civil law, a good illustration is uh, if you're a farmer and you have an ox that you use for going round and round, trampling out grain, why well, don't put a mask on them. You drive the creature crazy. It looks at those weedies and can't take a swipe of them. Now, what kind of farmer are you? Take it off. And Paul said, did you get the point? Pay your pastor. <laughs> That's what he got out of that. He jumped from, but it wasn't a jump. It was the same thing. Uh, God is encouraging gentleness and uh, transparency and open-handedness of his men and women. If someone is sharing the word of God with you, then for Pete's sake, don't forget to be kind back. Uh, Paul used that not only once in the Corinthian, but he used it a second time in the pastorals. So he's still using the principle, even though most people aren't on a farm. And anyway, we have combines today. So you don't need an ox tramping around there. But the principle is still important. How's that? Yeah, it's, so so if somebody said, does the Mosaic law still apply? How, how, how do you answer that? You say basically just the weightier matters? Yeah, the principles are still there, even though I would say, if you say uh, it doesn't apply, uh, would be the ceremonial. But on the ceremonial, I think that uh, uh, the writer to Hebrews has spoken to us very clearly about that. So, so let me ask a question to clarify on that as well. So would, do you think it's better for us to say that the moral parts of the Mosaic Law still apply or to say that there are moral principles, there are things that, uh, morals that God cares about that actually transcend the Mosaic Law? In other words, they're common throughout history and the Mosaic Law is one expression of them but that we actually hold to those things is still binding and still true because there are things God cares about, uh, kind of like a law throughout history, in a sense. There are certain things that morality cares about, one expression of which was the Mosaic Covenant, but there's an ongoing care about those things. It's portions. okay, but it makes me nervous to put it that second way. Uh, I, I'd rather say that the law of God had the authority of God behind it and uh, many of its principles still stand. So when he tells them, put on, most of them have flat roofs. They didn't have peaked roofs. So if you have a roof uh, and people are going up there, then put a balustrade around the thing. Now, today we don't have flat roofs, or most homes don't. But they do have swimming pools out back. So put a fence around it. So none of the animals or children in the neighborhood come. I think that's a direct application of safety up on the roof. Uh, same thing. Uh, so uh, God's reason and his authority and his law for doing that, 
abides, abides. Uh, not because the law does, but because he abides. Uh, we say that in the, uh, the uh, when we talk about the moral law of God, that is true because it reflects the character of God. And the character of God is consistent. And therefore, it will always be wrong to do certain things. Uh, because God is true, you tell the truth. That's not an option. Uh, it comes from the character of God. So the moral aspect of the law is established by the character and nature and attributes of God. Uh, the ceremonial is true because who said it? And the reason he said it, because he was pointing to what he was going to do. But he did it. And therefore, we should not stand around as if he hadn't done it. He did. Up from the grave he arose. Finney, close that book. So uh, that's it. The more difficult one is uh, civil law ones. Uh, but still, I would think there are principles involved in, in every one of those. Uh, matter of fact, even within Isaiah itself, I can't think of the chapter right now, but it talks about uh, the people who, because of physical disabilities and were challenged, they were not allowed to enter into the house of God, but they are allowed here. Mosaic law said no, Isaiah says yes. And that makes me think there's something I haven't covered yet uh, that is there uh, in, in that spot. So that's left in my thinking to uh, capture that, but at least I've got that in the back of my mind as an illustration. I've forgotten the chapter 50. Six, seven. Six, is it? Yeah, six, yeah. yeah. House of Prayer passage, that's why we know it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good, thank you, yeah. So that's an illustration of uh, something that uh, in the civil law. But I think the issue is not in ceremonial, it's not in the moral, but it's in the civil. And it's not as law, but it's rather because of who said it and the principles that he has. And grabbing hold of those principles is, uh, for a lot of them, not easy as the one about the putting a fence around a swimming pool. That, that's much more obvious. Or even uh, uh, take the mask off of a ox that's going around because, come on, God wants to have generous, open-handed people. And uh, Paul asked, is this that God was concerned for oxen? Was this Oxen Week uh, 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 in Corinth? No, no. He said it was, he wrote that for us, not for oxen. Which is interesting, too. So it looks like the law and the rule is for oxen, but no, it's for oxen owners. Yeah. What should happen to them? Liz. Um. What is your opinion about the appointed times that are listed in Leviticus 23, the Sabbath, Passover, all of to the Feast of Tabernacles, as far as the um, significance for the church today and whether we should understand and observe them, not observe as, as if we're Jewish, but because of the prophetic nature of um, how they reveal how Jesus is going to redeem mankind, what do you feel like is... The, the place of the church in understanding these things? or Well, let's begin with the obvious one, and that is Passover. Uh, up until Constantine's time, uh, the church and the Jewish people celebrated Passover at the same time. Then uh, Chrysostom and Constantine got together and said, we shouldn't have the holiest of all days celebrated on the same day 
as those, uh, uh, I don't know, use another word, so-and-so uh, Jews. And so they broke away. And now uh, Passover hits with Easter practically, what, every six years or something like that. It, it does not fit at all. Uh, and yet, it's the most celebrated even in the New Testament, in the Eucharist and the Lord's Supper. So uh, then, uh, secondly, I would observe that uh, the Feast of Ingathering, which comes in the September, October, uh, is also spoken of in Zechariah. And it says that in the last day, Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 4, all nations who never got a chance to go up on the summer tour with Samuel are going to go to Israel. So don't worry, you're going to get there. A matter of fact, you must. If any nation fails to go up, there's going to be no rain on their crops that year, it says. So, uh, boy, that's the second feast. So we got two of them down here. Uh, I think that they have a prophetic, forward-looking aspect to them. Uh, call them typical, if you will, but they do have a forward aspect. Uh, what to say about some of them, though, like, uh, which is not one of the major feast days of Rosh Hashanah, uh, New Year's, uh, which uh, comes in uh, September, October. Uh, and there, traditionally, like at the end of the Book of Micah, they would go, uh, any devout Jewish man, would go by a stream of living water and would reach in his pockets and symbolically tishlak, throw all of his sins, and they would be washed away. And that's where Micah gets his name from, me, M-I, who, and the C or C-H is as, or like, uh, Yah, who is like the Lord. Michael, Michelle, uh, Micah, all of those names. Ask the question, is there anyone who comes anywhere close to being like the, the living God? And uh, Micah ends by saying, who can pardon sins like God can? And puts it right in the context of Tishlach, where they throw all their sins into the stream that day. So I'm not altogether apprised on it, but I have enough hints in the biblical text to say God's not finished with those feast days yet. And anyway, not all of them were on the seventh day that they were to keep holy. Half of them also put, guess what, the eighth day which is Sunday, and made that holy, and they were to do no work in it. And that's my answer to Seventh-day Adventists. And I say, hey, look here. Half of the feast days have a day to celebrate on the eighth day. And uh, they say that's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> so... A good question, but I can only give part of the uh, answer to you. But it's enough to suggest there's a whole lot here that we should be looking into. And I just regret that Constantine and uh, his uh, silver-mouthed orator uh, uh, Chrysostom uh, just separated that trying to distance themselves from uh, the uh, uh, Jewish uh, group. The Christian church has an awful lot of explaining to do 
when we meet our Lord. For anti-Semitism has its roots, and the Holocaust has its roots in the church. Uh, I did a book just recently called Jewish Christianity, an oxymoron if there ever was one, uh, and uh, argue there uh, against the practice of anti-Semitism while also arguing against replacement theology. So let me ask a question on a, because um, like you've said, the, the importance of the Old Testament is it's typically neglected. Sometimes to a, a 21st century reader opens the, new, uh, opens the Old Testament, they start reading, and from their perspective, they say, it seems like God sometimes doesn't care about human rights. You know, they say, this seems genocidal, or why, is, why does it seem like there's allowances or tolerances for slavery or other things? And I know you've written a book on this subject, but how would you help, you know, a young adult opening the Old Testament for the first time, reading some of those passages, and just going, wait a minute, this, this, this seems... Um, in some cases, unfair or unright, or, or it brings up those questions for them when they're reading those texts. Well, if they're getting a message of unfair or it not being right at all, we don't have a concept of right or fairness unless we have God and have the uh, revelation that is found in those texts. Sometimes it's because of poor understanding. I have one of my students write me from South America, and he was a missionary, but also a agricultural consultant. And he said, what about this? I think it was Leviticus 18, where you shouldn't sow certain things together, certain seeds. And uh, I wrote back and I said, I think there's a good reason for that. God's not being unfair. Uh, when you don't have a burpee seed company nearby that's going to produce the seed for next year, you've got to get it out of last year's seed. So don't plant two kinds of things close together because the germination, of being from the farm, I knew this, that the German is going to go way down the next year. You're only going to get 30%. You're killing yourself by doing that. Now, a city slicker wouldn't know that, that indeed that was, there was a reason behind that. But the same thing with regard to uh, what God says about life uh, and all of its forms, uh, especially human life. And uh, I guess the uh, great passage here would be Micah uh, 6, uh, 7, and 8. What does the Lord require you but justice and mercy? And uh, we translate the next one, walking humbly with your God. But uh, that same one was picked up in Matthew 23, 23 the passage I just quoted. And Jesus went back to the same thing. What's God want out of me anyway? And he's just given this whole book of uh, ethical and moral instruction. And he puts justice and uh, mercy and faithfulness or faith in God uh, as the root issues on the, all those uh, uh, same things. So... Human rights uh, are not established in our Constitution in the United States. If God doesn't validate them, then uh, we are all junk. And there just is uh, no way to validate our worth. You've got to have a supreme being, the living God, who declares himself and stands behind that as the maker and founder, and then you've got manufacturer's instructions too. <laughs> and he had the right to put manufacturer's instructions in the box, which we have in the Bible. 
So um, I want to go back to the hermeneutics of the prophetic books. And uh, in the earlier session, you mentioned that there is already and not yet. I've heard of other scholars who use words like near, far fulfillment, double fulfillment, and even some use multiple fulfillment. You want to comment on uh, the use of the Old Testament passage and the prophecy reoccurring in the future times, in the fulfillment New Testament. Maybe you can help us here. Yeah, the expression I do not like is double fulfillment which seems to indicate that uh, there are uh, uh, two ways of looking at this, two different ways of looking at it. Actually, uh, I, I would prefer multiple fulfillments that are in the same kind. And therefore, uh, you can have a prophecy about the seed of the woman but they're all going to be from a certain family uh, according to uh, the Word of God. Uh, and therefore, I like multiple fulfillments, but double seems to indicate it meant this used to, but now it means that, and they're separated, and they're two separate meanings. So to clarify, because you used the word uh, already and not yet, implying the tension of uh, fulfillment in two periods of time. So help us integrate what you just mentioned about multiple fulfillment and the already and not yet reality. In the already and not yet, the not yet partakes of many of the uh, same contents. Sometimes you'll have 70% or more that is already in place. And this is added and supplemented by additional things of the same kind. So that, uh, beloved, uh, 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 the Antichrist will come and already many Antichrists have come. Well, all of these monarchs have one or more of the characteristics of that final dude who's going to show up. But uh, you're not talking about two separate subjects or identities. Uh, they, they have some unifying collective uh, idea that brings them together. Only the last one is the one that supersedes it. Uh, so that would be true of uh, both the seed of... Uh, uh, the woman and the seed of uh, uh, humans. Uh, they, they just run in uh, different tracks altogether. But I like the concept of multiple fulfillment because uh, uh, the day of the Lord, for example, uh, I think I can point to five historical places where the day of the Lord came in the past, but they have just little pieces in common of what is coming in that last day, and that exceeds everything else. But to say it's double fulfillment, some would think that the A, B, C, and D that preceded. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, Joel for example, speaks of the uh, day of the Lord. I think the locust plague that they were under in that book, one, two, three, four waves of locusts coming in, perhaps. Uh, uh, but uh, boy, they don't amount to what that final day when our Lord Jesus steps into history is going to be like. So there is the, the now and the not yet. But they, there is some part they share. But double fulfillment would make the locust plague something altogether separate and then another fulfillment later on in history. But see no uh, constant uh, continuity. Or um, on the day of Pentecost, Peter says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. 
another illustration of that, that same kind of thing. I think the descent of the Holy Spirit there at Pentecost was another installment on what God's going to do in the final day, only in a much bigger way. Amen. Yeah. So I have one. Um, yeah. And this one... Make it easy, Joel. Well, yeah. I, <laughs> okay, so one of the big issues, concerns with pastors and leaders right now is the issue of cultural engagement. So looking at larger trends in theology, in the church, in seminary, past 40 years, let's just say. So you begin, you know, back, let's say, back in the 80s, uh, dispensational premillennialism was pretty much the theology that just about, you know, that was the majority position. Um, one of the criticisms of, of pre-tribulational dispensational premillennialism is that it can often tend to, not always, but it can tend to encourage a lack of engagement. Some people will call it uh, abandonment theology. Some of that is because of the issue of um, the pre-trib rapture. Some of it is because of the um, primarily um, negative pessimistic view on the last days that it's just all about everything's getting worse, culture's getting worse, the whole world's getting worse. And I think it was Tim LaHaye that, I think it was Tim LaHaye said, you know, the famous quote, uh, why polish the brass on a sinking ship? Might have been Hal Lindsey. So then you come out of the 80s, 1988, 88 reasons why the rapture will happen in 1988. And a large section of the church is sort of, um, put off by the whole issue of dispensationalism, the end times and all this. That book's on sale now. Yeah, well actually it's, I, I bought one as a object lesson off of Amazon, it was like 10 bucks um, <laughs> for like this little booklet. Um, but so then what happens is people, as we tend to do, we overreact. And so um, everybody jumps off of the dispensational premillennialism uh, bandwagon and it seems like the trend right now among young seminary students, among the millennials, the younger population, is everybody's sort of gravitating more toward a reformed um, perspective and embracing either amillennialism or postmillennialism. Kingdom now, which, and I think a lot of pastors look at that and they go, this is the perfect framework to encourage cultural engagement. Because essentially if the kingdom of God is now our primary mission is to appropriate that reality on the earth and so forth. So now coming back to this issue, let's say if we didn't, you know, embrace that radical swing of the pendulism to throw out the baby with the bathwater, here we are in this camp of classic premillennialism. Um, talk about motivation for those who are in the camp of classic premill. What is our primary motivation? for cultural engagement. What, what is it, like, what is our main mission as classic, you know, cla if we're in the camp of classic pre-mill, what is our primary mission in terms of impacting the world? Um, how does that relate to this larger um, mandate to proclaim this coming kingdom as we're trying to impact and influence the world as salt and light now? So it's, this is also kind of tying into this whole now and not yet tension that we live in? Well, I think it is first of all to teach that God is a God of truth. What God established as he began the program, he's still on track and on message. And therefore, I don't know how we can speak of cultural relevance, relevance without the same time making it clear that God has spoken and what he has promised is true. Uh, I would think uh, that is very, very important. It is true that uh, covenant or reform theology has made tremendous strides among the evangelical Baptistic uh, community, that side of the ledger. Uh, 
they probably have become uh, four and a half point Calvinist uh, total depravity T unlimited uh, atonement uh, no uh, no T U limited atonement is the third one that's the big issue there some people say Christ died only for the elect but most Baptists and independents and uh, Pentecostals and others will say, no, no, he is the Savior of all men, especially to them that believe, 1 Timothy 4.10. Uh, and so they will say Christ died for uh, those who, for the whole world, but only it's a... Uh, 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 efficient only for those who believe. Uh, and then you have uh, irresistible grace and then perseverance of the saints. So the whole concept of the sovereignty of God has gained huge traction in our day. And that's one of your clues that you're speaking in terms of a Reformed theology. But with it, has come an a-mill or a post-mill uh, view. And most people think that goes along with it, but that's not true. There are, at the turn of the 20th century, 1900s, uh, five of the leading pre-mill writers were Presbyterian pastors. Uh, the Thousand Years, the book entitled uh, The Thousand Years. Nathaniel uh, huh? Nathaniel West. Nathaniel West, good for you. Uh, and he was Presbyterian. Uh, he's only representative of uh, uh, the another four that were there. But today, it is assumed that if you are reformed in your uh, general thesis of the Five points of Calvinism, T U L I P, tulip. And the, the flower for the Arminians, you know, is supposed to be Daisy. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just helping you with your botany here. <laughs> but at, at any rate, uh, I think uh, that is what has motivated a, a lot of it. And then I think just cultural belonging. We have more of our young people going to uh, advanced education and they've heard this uh, great theme, but they need to understand that premillennialism has got to beat because it has a view of culture and of Christ redeeming culture itself, not only men and women, but uh, also has an answer in which he comes to be uh, king of kings and lord of lords and uh, uh, brings a whole concept of uh, justice and mercy and truth and righteousness as a part of his uh, theme. And so I tell him, read Samuel's books. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no. Dr. Kaiser, my name is Isaac Bennett. Um, my question has to do in regards to the Jerusalem Council on Acts 15. You mentioned it in the first session. And I'm just wondering if you think there's a, like a notable significance as to why James seems to be quoting Amos 9:11 in regards to the inclusion of the Gentiles into the new covenant. And if there's significance like related to the Davidic form of worship and kind of secondary to that, why is James kind of like changing, you know, the, the remnant of Edom, like it says in, in Amos 9, to the Gentiles? Like, why is that the text rather than, say, Isaiah 66 or Isaiah 9, where it's more evident that Gentiles are coming in, they're going to be priests or so on and so forth? I that Have I got good news for you? Amos 9 is the right text. And more than that, 
uh, Amos uh, uh, goes on to uh, make uh, some amazing statements here that uh, also help us to see that uh, uh, a surprise that came. When we studied the Dead Sea Scrolls, lo and behold, the text that we found, we didn't find the whole book of Amos, we did find this passage of it. And uh, uh, it comes out with a, a beautiful uh, uh, surprise. Let me read this. Uh, in that day, this is 9-11. In that day, I will restore David's fallen hut. Well, here he has the tent or the house of David, the, the bayet, uh, which has become a dynasty. But he says it's uh, uh, no fail. Uh, it's uh, call active participles in the state of falling, falling down. And I will repair its burning plate, uh, broken places and restore its ruins and rebuild it as it used to be. Now, all English translations are chicken on this because every one of those pronouns is separate. Uh, he starts out, repair their broken pieces, feminine plural, not its, but their. Why feminine? North and South Kingdoms. God said, I'm going to repair their broken places and restore his ruins. Who's his? David. And uh, build her as it used to be. As it used to be. And her refers to the Sukkot, uh, or the Sukkah, Sukkot's plural. Uh, uh, to the ten, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Now that's where the new reading comes here. But it's easy to see how this came about. The word possess, Yadrash, let's see, I'm doing this from memory now. Yadrash is uh, to possess. Uh, Yadrash. Uh, Yadrash. Yada, the difference between the Resh and the Dalit is just that you would have a little uh, thing go across the top. Uh, and uh, uh, he says the remnant of Adam, Edom or Adam, man. They're both spelled the same way in the Constantinople text. Adam, Adam. Uh, Aleph, uh, uh, Dalit, uh, Mem. Uh, so uh, that uh, they may uh, uh, possess or uh, they may uh, inherit here uh, the, uh, uh, I forget the word, uh, for the remnant of man, uh, even. All the nations, I take the word, uh, the vav there, the and to be even all the nations that bear my name. So they may possess this uh, uh, or uh, inherit the uh, remnant of the uh, people, even all the nations that bear my name. And that comes... That's almost the exact reading of Acts 15. And we do now have a Dead Sea Scroll that read that way too as well. So it leads to the question, which is the uh, more uh, accurate uh, uh, reading? But I think that's, that's the text that Amos uh, should have had here because he says... Uh, yeah, David's dynasty now is in pretty bad shape. It's collapsing. But uh, uh, that may be falling, but I'm going to repair it and uh, 
bring back the north and the south, the two kingdoms, go and join them together. Well, that's what Ezekiel is saying too, where there'd be uh, one people and one nation and one king and one God, uses one nine times there, and uses not Yahid, but like in the Trinity, Echad, uh, like uh, he uses in Genesis, uh, God brought the man and woman together and they were one flesh, Echad. Uh, very important in our argument over, do we believe in three gods or one God? <laughs> we say one God in three persons. Uh, and uh, it's because of the Hebrew word Echad. So, uh, but the point here is that all the nations may come to faith. Uh, and it is a, a text that fits into the Romans 11 text that just before the whole of Israel is redeemed and saved, there comes a massive turning uh, to uh, the Lord Christ in the Gentile world. And we may not be seeing it as graphically in America, but in the last decade and a half, maybe a little more, two million Islamic Mohammedans that have believed in Allah and in Muhammad as his messenger have had a dream. And they say, we've got to go find a book. And they find the book and they say, that's him. That's the one that appeared in my dream. And I think there's been linked to the church in recent days some two million uh, Gentiles we've never seen before. Never seen. And so that's uh, even all the nations that have my name called over them. So when I preached the great revival text, I was in Nigeria earlier last month, and uh, I used the text, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, everyone says, oh, no, no, it's Jewish. That was addressed to Jewish people. Matter of fact, one of the men on the program said, Walter, you're, you're not interpreting that right. I said, oh, yes, I am. There's a comma. If my people, comma, who are called by my name, or King James, which are called by my name, comma, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. They said, whose land? I said, any land. Because all that God calls his name over, he owns. Used in Old Testament, New Testament. Anyone who believes has God's name called over them. They're owned by God. And same thing here too as well. Uh, even all the nations that bear my name. That bear my name. So it's a great text. And it fits right in with the promised plan and is the continuation of it. And uh, Amos knew what he was talking about. And uh, so did uh, the Jerusalem Council because uh, they bring that up too as well and say, look, what is happening here among our people is in agreement with the prophets. Then he quotes this verse and said, see, See, so he thinks this is a fulfillment uh, of what was happening on that day. But I'm telling you, that's just down payment money. That's just earnest money. Yeah, the, the word earnest in New Testament, we talk about the earnest of the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, that's uh, engagement ring. Uh, arabona in modern Greek, you tell a, a girl you're going to give her an arabona, it's, a, it's an engagement ring, which means the guy is claiming one finger. He'll be back for the rest. 
<laughs> well, I got to think about that. <laughs> well, thank you. That seems like an appropriate place to end. We'll be joining again tomorrow, same time, same place, 2 p.m. We'll, we'll be focused a little more tomorrow on some end times subjects. So uh, join us again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.